Hi folks, this is your favorite skeleton, Nick Calavera, and you're listening to Monster Porn, the only horror podcast you have to delete from your browser history in case your mom uses your computer. But before you set your computer on fire to avoid a string of awkward questions from concerned family members, don't forget to leave a five-star rating and review on iTunes or your podcast listening app of choice. I think I nailed it. Okay, somebody give me some matches because I need to burn this computer before my mom starts asking questions. Welcome to Monster Porn, weird fiction and horror podcast. The podcast that's the only podcast to touch you in your twilight zone and outer limits. Today's story, In the Dead of Tinder, by Brett Norwood, with special musical guest, To Edit is Human. St. Pete's Cemetery, where the ghouls go for spirits. I'd been there every night that week, self-medicating my metaphysical existential pain with pints of All Hallows Ale. I had a corner booth by the skeleton tree where I was joined by a detached head named Jimmy Dahlberg, a cynical rotting cranium who was a regular. While I was watching a buxom ghoul who was ordering at the bar, Jimmy asked me, so what's your story, you creepy fucker? You strike me as the Alistair Crowley type. Devil with dark archaic forces. Go slowly mad imagining entities that never were nor will be. Overdose on opioids in the middle of the floor of a whorehouse at ten in the morning on a weekday. Mm, not exactly. What is it, then? You definitely strike me as a ghost with unfinished business. You don't want to know my story. What's her story? Oh, you don't want to mess with that. That's White Willie's woman. I ain't ever seen White Willie in person, but his reputation precedes him. He's a stiff you don't want to fuck with. Get caught glancing too long at that, and he'll call in a priest to exercise you just to make an example of you. But seriously, why so closed off? You're nailed shut like a coffin in a vampire plague. What are you hiding, tall, bald, and brooding? <sighs> it's not that I dabbled with dark forces, Jimmy. It's that I dabbled with God. I dabbled enough to make certain sacrifices for that aloof spirit, but not enough for those sacrifices to pay off. And now, I've left life at a net loss, and early, and unable to enter either heaven or what hides below. Ah, a classic tale. Me, I'm just bound to this earth because the rest of me is still hiding somewhere, and I can't find peace until it is collected. Mostly my Jimmy. Jimmy's Jimmy. The other parts aren't as important. I hope you find your wiener someday. I appreciate that. To Jimmy's Johnson, may it be recovered and be incorrupt. Here, yeah, here. Yeah. And may the rigor mortis still be set in. Jimmy, tell me, do you ever feel like your life was nothing but fruitless work? Like all your labor was wasted, failing to fulfill even the most important aims for which you'd undertaken them in the first place? Thoughts every wandering earthbound soul in this joint creepy. If it weren't so, we'd all be sleeping tight until the final day, like all the good Christian saints in their tombs. Do you ever wish you could have a do-over? I certainly would have made some different choices, like avoiding the Mexican cartel that parted me from my rooster and cajones. You know, when I find myself, I hope I can find my right hand, too. No reason. What the shit you doing, hombre sombre? I told you you don't want to watch that broad. She's looking at me, Jimmy. 
Yeah, because you're staring at her like a corpse. No. Her manner says to me, come a little bit closer, you're my kind of man. You know how that song ends, right? Yes, actually. Rather than ending on the root chord, it fades out like a lot of radio singles from that period. No. I mean the story in the song. Just like in El Paso. Just like in Give Me Two Steps. It's never a happy story, man. Happiness is overrated. Wait. Come back here. Don't. Mm -hmm. You could have at least given me a hand with my drink one more time before you run to the embrace of the second death. You should just know she's probably drained the fluids from more dead people than a mortician. <laughs> Someone wants to meet you, the notification said. He swiped it away, muttering, Unlikely, and set his phone back on the table. Do you need to take that? The client wondered. David looked him in the eye and said, No, it's nothing. Plenty of Fish, the dating app, was aptly named. There were plenty of fish, plenty of catfish, fake accounts ripped from real accounts or from Instagram models who tried to get you talking to them, to get your information for a con or else to market adult friend fighter sites or escort services to you. David bet that women had no idea what the app was like for the hetero male users. Getting swamped with fakes trying to sell you weird shit. On the other hand, hetero women had to deal with real guys mobbing them and trying to get them to do weird shit. So there's that. David watched a woman pass over the client's shoulder. Short, brunette, curly hair. Exactly what David liked. I love the feedback you gave me on the SEO, the client said. Exuding so much unnatural enthusiasm, it hurt David to bear. That is exactly the kind of thing I need. Like, I tried to get into website stuff myself, but I'm just a dabbler, and I don't have the time. I need a pro, and it's absolutely... Worth it to set some money aside to pay you to get it done. Sounds great, David told him. The client was a real estate guy. His exuberance befitted a salesman of the biggest scale sales. Fantastic, the client said, and he launched into a fairly lengthy description of just how fantastic it was, while David's phone buzzed again. He checked it. The screen lit up with the hesitation of an aging, discontinued model, and the notification said, again, someone wants to meet you. Huh, same girl, he thought. Trying a little hard, aren't we, pretend person? Really, the client said. If you need to take that. No, David interrupted. It is literally nothing. <laughs> Someday, spring would blossom like a sunflower to embrace David with a desire to continue living. But for now, the March air still whispered of hypothermic death, of hapless Jack London narrators perishing in the Arctic when they've failed to light a fire and night is coming on like the reaper. And this wasn't even the Arctic, but the high plains. It should have been getting warmer as March progressed, but it only got colder, and the sky duller and David's face got duller in the mirror every day, paler and more expressionless. The wind whipped David in the face as he forced himself to walk through the park. It burned. When the air was still, it wasn't so bad, but whenever the breeze kicked up, it was downright miserable. All he had exposed were his nose and cheeks and eyes, and that was nearly too much to take. Further, his toes and fingers, though protected, were starting to get that dull burning ache from being too cold for too long. They would hurt more at this point when David got back indoors and life flowed back into them. The walk in the park had been wishful thinking, like trying to summon summer with the sympathetic magic of acting like it was there already. The old city park was dead as the tundra. The playset stood silent, dripping with icicles and dulled by frost. The river was hidden beneath a sheath of static ice and snow. 
The lawns were covered in wind-packed, smooth-dry old snow. The trees, of course, were the mere skeletons of their potential glory. David felt his phone vibrate deep within the pocket of the inner pair of the two pairs of pants he was wearing. He shoved a gloved hand into them and fished for it. On the third attempt at pressing the button with his gloved thumb, it finally lit up, hastelessly, fighting the cold for itself, and David saw yet another useless plenty of fish notification. Nadia 607212 has sent you a message, it said. David tapped the screen against his nose, the best exposed skin he had for doing so, to open the message. As he suspected, the message only said, Hey there, smiley face. They were always like that. The username would resemble a fairly common woman's name, but be off by one letter. In this case, Nadia, instead of the more expected Nadia. And then followed by a string of six or so numbers. They would send the same hey there with the same ASCII smiley face and same capitalization. David knew if he drilled down into her profile, he would probably find that she had exactly two photos. Her second language was English, even though she appeared to be a local white girl, and that her listed hair and eye color did not match the photos. Her bio would either be three dots or simply looking for hookup. Before David returned the phone to his inner pocket, he noted that this was the same fake profile as the day before, or, at least, used the same photo of a sandy-haired, plain-looking girl with lots of eyeliner taking a mirror selfie. David also had Tinder and Bumble on his phone. He'd had all three apps for about six months now, but had yet to end up on a date with anyone. Matches came rarely enough through Tinder and Bumble that he'd only had a couple decent conversations through them, neither of which had ended up in a date, but had just petered out. He'd had a couple older women who were single mothers reach out to him on Plenty of Fish, but that really wasn't what he was looking for. That was fine, but he still dreamed of starting his own new family from scratch. But here he was getting older, and the younger women on these apps were still very selective about who they wanted to talk to. Apparently. It wasn't generally the 34-year-old freelance website consultant who was zero for zero on the trifecta of tall, dark, and handsome. Whenever he messaged a woman he thought was attractive and met his ideal criteria, he got the soft rejection of silence in return. David was headed back to his apartment now. He'd had well enough of the obliterating cold. He rushed with his head down along the sidewalk of a back street when his phone buzzed again. For how rarely he was rewarded for checking the notification. It surprised him a little bit. He still cared to read it immediately. Such is the curse called hope, he thought, and read the notification. The same profile, Nadia with all the numbers, had messaged him again. It read, Are you single? Wouldn't be on this stupid fucking app if I weren't. He muttered to no one and put the phone away. So how's the Tinder experiment going? Madeline asked him. She and David were in a cafe downtown for lunch. David shook his head and finished chewing before answering. Nothing, he said, smiling apologetically. Really? She replied. No, David went on. Had a few conversations, but nothing that led to a date. Do you need someone to take pictures of you? I can take some pictures for you, Madeline offered. Oh, maybe, David said, but he rather thought he already had about as good of pictures of himself as pictures of himself could be. Still, maybe what his profile needed was a woman's touch. He just worried that Madeline's input would be like having his mother orchestrate his dating profile. A bunch of nice guy in business casual clothes photos with a bio about how put together and nice he is and how he's seeking a good, family-oriented woman with birthing hips. I mean, if you want to, he told her. It could be good to have a real live woman's input. Can I see it? 
she asked. Her eyes twinkled. What, my Tinder profile? Yeah, sure. David hesitated as he drew out his phone. He realized at that moment he was extremely uncomfortable having someone he knew in real life pass judgment on his Tinder profile. If there were parts of it he should be embarrassed about, he felt a bit like ignorance was bliss. He'd rather not know just how bad it was. Still, taking his time, he opened the app and went to his profile. He handed the phone over. Madeline lowered her eyes and grew pensive. She took her time, eyeing it over, scrolling through the photos, reading the bio at least twice, swiping through his attached Instagram account, scrolling up and down over the whole thing several times while David waited in silence, trying to enjoy his blue cheese chicken brioche. Madeline made a sing-song humming noise to show she was thinking. Not bad, she ruled eventually. Not bad, he echoed. You look like a monk. What? This photo. You look like a monk. Okay. I guess I'll can that one. Yeah, I mean, it's not bad if you're trying to rock the tauntered look and hook up with the hot young monkettes, or nuns. <clears throat> I guess the light was showing through the top of my hair in that one, David explained. Madeline looked up from the app. What hair? Ha. Huh. Touché. No, but seriously, it's good, Madeline admitted. You present yourself very well. Thank you. But if I were you, I'd put something more into your bio. I mean, the joke is okay, but it doesn't say who you are and what you have to offer, right? Well, girls don't like who I am, and I don't know what I have to offer. <laughs> oh, stop. You're one of the most put-together, responsible guys I know. Is that what turns the hot young nuns on? That and fingering their rosaries, for sure. <laughs> oh, jeez. <laughs> you should tell them more about your work. I should? It's boring. Oh, absolutely. And say you like hiking. Everybody likes hiking. What's this here? Huh? What are you doing? Don't do anything on there. Oh, I'm just looking at this chick, she said, flashing the phone at him. You don't want that, do you? She looks like a skank. Can I swipe? Uh, I don't know. Let me look. Madeline showed him the screen again. It said, Rosanna, 19, Abzarka University, 17 miles away. The top picture showed a brunette with a long, narrow, but attractive face. She looked like she was still a kid to David, and, indeed, she was only 19. But sometimes 19 looked like 25, and sometimes it looked like 15. It didn't necessarily make her unattractive, and David rather disagreed with Madeline's ruling of skank. But her young face did make David uncomfortable. She reminded him of his ex-girlfriend's little sister. Does she have a bio? David asked. Really? You want to know who this is? Madeline murmured. I just want to weigh all the evidence before handing off to the jury, that's all. Madeline rolled her eyes and asked. Okay. How do I see the bio? Here? Yeah, the tap the info button. Don't swipe up, whatever you do. Why, what's that do? Super like. Oh. Yeah. Okay, yeah, it says her pupper is her life, and she wishes she had someone who looks at her like she looks at donuts. Classy. Well, at least she's kind of funny, David said. Madeline scowled at the phone. You want me to swipe right? Uh, no. No, better swipe left. She looks really young. Okay. Madeline swiped, and David watched her face as the next woman came up. Oh, my. She failed for words, but showed the screen to David after a moment. David groaned. The woman was eminently unattractive, obese with a double chin and wide jaw, pockmarks on her face, and a mannish smile. She looked 53, but was listed as 39. Left, David said. What happened to wanting all the evidence before handing over to the jury? Madeline taunted. 
David laughed, and all he said was, well. They swiped through a few women together, having a good time of it as David loosened up. Eventually, Madeline wandered to the third and final tab in the app, where your matches and conversations would show up. David shrunk a little as she saw that there was nothing there. She cleared her throat. What's this? She pointed at a circle on the screen that had three plus on it. It means that at least three users I haven't matched with have liked me, David explained. Oh, can we see who they are? She wondered, already tapping on it. Oh, she said again, as the upsell pop-up displayed for Tinder Gold. You have to buy a subscription to see who they are, David explained. That's dumb, Madeline said. Yeah, David said, and he sighed. But I broke down and did it once. I was getting these notifications saying that somebody on Tinder had liked me, but I was never matching with anyone, so I wondered who these women were, and I broke down and I bought a month of gold. David took a breath. There were 15 profiles. Oh, that's pretty good, Madeline interrupted. Yeah, but 14 of them were either morbidly obese or 40-something mothers of teenagers who don't want more kids. Not that that's a bad thing, it's just not ideal. I mean, for the right person, maybe, that's fine, but it's not my ideal. The remaining girl was fairly attractive, and I almost decided to match with her, but she lives all the way in Williamston and explicitly said she never wants children. Overall, the Tinder experiment is validating my real-world experience. Almost no attractive women are the least bit interested in me. That's not true, Madeline assured him. David shrugged and continued slowly. I go around town and attractive women won't even look at me in the eye. Eye contact is a good indicator, you know. When the defenses are up, even if she's smiling and being nice, She's telling you she's not interested by avoiding your eyes. I mean, what does it take? Am I just aiming too high? I'm not going to settle and hunger down with someone I'm not attracted to just to have somebody. You're being too hard on yourself, David, Madeline said. It's hard, I know, especially for a guy. Women are picky. But, like, what about Emma? She was attractive. Not to drag up the past, but, I mean, she was an attractive young woman, so that's kind of proof against what you're saying. David shrugged. Madeline touched his arm. You are a catch. The fact that the very instant you came out of your shell, you got into a mostly positive, stable relationship that lasted three years. Yeah, 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 David cut her off. But... It strangely feels like it never even happened now. It was another life. Look, what if you're hiding behind these apps, in a sense, she said. Maybe you'd have better luck going out and trying to talk to people in real life, face to face, you know? Maybe you're right, he admitted, but mostly because he wanted to change the subject now. I think you're correct about the eye contact thing but sometimes you have to break through those defenses a little bit before somebody starts to warm up to you, you know? Hmm, David toned. Madeline had started navigating through David's Tinder again, a pensive look on her face. Well, I hate to break this up, but I should probably get home because Mikey will be home for lunch about now. Oh, <laughs> by all means, go feed your husband, David told her. As Madeline set the phone down in front of David, for the brief moment before the screen went blank, David caught a glimpse of a profile picture he knew was familiar. It only took him a second or two to remember that the sandy blonde girl with the eyeliner had been the profile picture of the fake account on Plenty of Fish that had been trying to message him. Outside the cafe, the cold wind blasted David and Madeline in their exposed faces burning their cheeks and noses red. As squinting and miserable, they had a hug and David said, See ya, buddy. Thanks for brunch. 
You betcha, she said, retracting her neck into her fur-lined coat like a turtle as she released and began to run to her car. Alone at home in his apartment, David sat in the old office chair by the radiator and looked at Tinder. Maybe she's not a fake account after all, he mumbled. It said, Nadia, 23, 15 miles away. He looked for her bio block. It just read, Nothing to say, followed by a shrug emoticon. Well, David muttered. He went through her pictures. Her second photo was another mirror selfie. This one was clearly taken in a public restroom somewhere. She stood in the middle of the jaundiced fluorescent lighting of a spacious tiled room. She looked serious. She didn't look into the mirror, but into the phone screen as she took the picture. David noted that she had a fine figure in a black sweater and black jeans. She was kind of plain, but healthy and really good-looking, to be frank. If this was actually a real person, and she actually had been trying to talk to him on Plenty of Fish, this was easily the best lead he'd had in ages. The thought occurred to him. God, what if the other profiles that opened with Hey There, colon, close parenthesis, that I wrote off as fakes were real people? What if Hey There, smiley face just happens to be a phrase that women tend to feel comfortable opening with? The next pic of Nadia wasn't a photo at all, but a short video loop. She was outdoors in the snow by a lake that was frozen over. On the other side of the lake, there was a dark grove of trees. She, on this side, lounged on the pier, dressed way too lightly for the weather, in a gray dolman and blue jeans. She smirked at the shaking camera, which approached her for a few trudging steps before resetting and looping from the beginning. David admired her long, lithe legs in those skinny jeans. As the video looped, her right leg shifted. Her head began to turn away from the camera. Then it reset. The last image was yet another mirror selfie. This one was in a home bathroom and taken in between two opposing bathroom mirrors so that Nadia recurred manifold. Her face, then back of head, then face, then back of head, then face, etc. Her hair was in a messy bun. She smirked coolly and gazed at her phone screen. Wherever she appeared from the back, David could see the screen of the phone, and he noted with some curiosity that the image on the phone should have been a recursion of this whole recurring image all over again. But it didn't appear to be. It looked like random pixelated noise in a different color entirely. David hesitated for a long time, staring at her profile, going through the photos slowly again and again. If this was a real person, and the same real person that was using this photo on Plenty of Fish, there was a better than average chance they would match if he swiped right. He worked over what he might say to her if they did. He chuckled and muttered, I'll just say, hey there, smiley face. He swiped right as his blood tingled. The profile vanished, and the app displayed, there's nobody new in your area. And nothing happened. David relaxed. End of the line, Valentine, he muttered, which he had made a ritual whenever he hit that screen. And he added, Well, that was anticlimactic. But I can still reply to her on plenty of fish if I want to, I suppose. Of course. I guess. Do I want to? I don't know. David tossed the phone onto the end table and went into the kitchen. <laughs> David woke from a dream about running through the snow, and the memory of the air's bite faded slowly from his face. He had the sense that he had been caught in a loop, the kind of dream where you dream that you wake up only to have the dream repeat, sometimes with variation, sometimes not. It was 1.11 a.m., according to the red digital face of the alarm clock. He mumbled something that did not sound like much, but was meant to express the idea, did my phone just buzz? David reached for the nightstand, 
shaking off the sheet that had wrapped around and tried to retain his hand, with a groan of frustration. His hand bolted into the cold air and retrieved his device. The screen lit up the night. The walls suddenly glowed dull blue. His eyes ached. It's a match, said one notification. A second said, Nadia has sent you a message. They were both time-stamped only a few minutes ago. No shit, David muttered, and he swiped to see the message. As the message loaded, he thought to himself, What the fuck are you doing on Tinder at one the fuck in the morning? The message just said, Hey. Groggy and wrapped up in a wee morning hour sense that nothing really matters, David went for a bold opening. He typed and sent, Well, if we're going to meet, I insist we do it in a neutral public place so you don't take advantage of me. He immediately regretted it. He let his phone fall with a clunk back onto the nightstand as the room went black. He was almost asleep when his phone buzzed again, yet his hand was holding the phone in record time. LOL, you're funny, she said. You're was spelled like the possessive pronoun. Another message showed up on the heels of the first. What are you doing on here at this hour? It sported two question marks. What the fuck, David muttered. He replied, LOL, you messaged me first at this ungodly hour. What you doing? Nothing, she replied. So tell me about yourself. Who are you? David asked. For a few minutes, David kept waking up the phone screen every time it went black as he waited. A reply came in. I'm nobody, really. LOL, same here, David replied. As the conversation went on, David got little out of her, but still she kept messaging back. Truthfully, the conversation left him a little cold. It was neither very flirty nor very interesting and he wondered why she was bothering keeping it alive. Around two in the morning, he asked Nadia if she'd want to get to know each other better over a cup of coffee. With that same unenthused passivity, she agreed. Thank you for your help, David told Madeline as he held the door for her and they entered Macy's in a flurry of old snow and fogged air. Of course, I got your back, she said, clunking the snow from her boots onto the entry rug. She shivered and eyed over the store. So, casual yet fashionable yet manly is the order, she recited. That's the order, David repeated. As she led David into the men's section, she asked him, So, what do you know about her? Nothing, basically. Hmm. Madeline toned. Oh, I like this. What about this? She was tugging on the sleeve of a red and black plaid shirt. Is I'm a lumberjack and that's okay, the message I really want to send? It doesn't say lumberjack. Lots of people are wearing red plaid. It says manly. It does seem popular right now, David observed. I saw a barista wearing one the other day. Well, there you go. She was a girl. Smart ass. What about something like this? Really? A polo shirt? I thought girls were supposed to be good at fashion. Does Mikey pick out your clothes for you? So, what you're saying is I look good. Thank you. And it says professional. What I get from it is retired and heading for the golf course. Oh, you... This isn't that kind of polo shirt. It's nicer than that. I mean, feel the material. That is nice, David admitted. But I'm not looking for something to wipe my ass. She laughed. If you're gonna be this difficult, you'll be on your own, bucko. What about this? David suggested. That is a t-shirt. Yeah, but it's a nice t-shirt, David retorted. Feel the material. Are you mocking me? 
No, I'm expressing only my genuine ignorance. I mean, come on, this is like a fashion cut or something. It's not like a normal t-shirt. It's v-neck or whatever. Well, maybe, Madeline admitted, but was already redirecting towards something else. Here we go. A Henley. That is perfect for you. She held a Henley off the rack. It was cool gray with interwoven blue threads. I don't hate it, David said slowly. Manly, casual, fashionable, she said. Try it on. David thought a moment and then said, Yes, ma'am. David took the shirt and went into the changing room. He nodded at the attendant, latched the door behind him, and hung the hanger on the hook. He found himself between two mirrors. He saw himself cascading ahead and behind into the microscopic, as a myriad of changing rooms succeeded in a drooping arc, as if pulled away by gravity. He stared at the back of his own head for a moment and noted how weird it was to see himself from such a detached angle, as if he was a stranger observing himself. Then his eyes fell onto his own, and they felt dead. David came out in the shirt. Yes, I like it, Madeline cheered. David nodded. I think I do too. You have excellent taste. The spitting snow darting across the black outside the cafe windows reminded one of old-time television static in Diagonal. David sat by the window and watched the cars come and go from the parking lot. He lit up his phone. He observed the time and the lack of any message. He sat back in the chair and kicked his feet. The wind gusted. A frigid burst struck David's face as the double door of the cafe was torn open by the wind and then slowly drifted shut again. A few snowflakes scattered and dissipated into the warm interior air. David's phone believed it was minus three outside before the wind chill. He shuddered as the cold air hit him. He wished he had a warm beverage to clutch, but he was waiting for her to order. He wore his new gray Henley, a new pair of slim-fit blue jeans, and just the slightest touch of Stetson. He let up his phone three times, letting it go to sleep again each time. The fourth time, he finally messaged her. Just wondering if you're going to be able to make it. He was about to tag on, because it's getting nasty out there and I don't blame you if you can't. But she already replied. Her message said, I am here. David involuntarily perked up, frowning thoughtfully first at the message to make sure he read it correctly, and then scanning the room nervously. At the cafe shack? I don't see you, he messaged back. He waited for her reply and looked around again at the same people he had already dismissed. There was a couple by the door and two guys in the corner. There was an old couple in the plush chairs by the bar. But there was no single woman in sight let alone anyone who even vaguely resembled Nadia's profile picture. His phone buzzed in his hand, startling him. The message said, I am with you. What could he make of that? Was she messing with him? Did she get confused and meet someone else somewhere else? The door rattled again, but did not blow all the way open. I don't know who you're with, but it doesn't seem to be me, lol, he replied. David waited, uneasy, scanning the room repeatedly. He took a sip of water. Of course I would get stood up, David thought. She was probably just messing with me all along, or just not that interested. She never sounded very interested, did she? God damn it. Once again, I put myself out on a limb for a hot girl, and I made the fool for believing I had a shot when really her disinterest was clear from the start. There's a reason the list of women who have liked me on Tinder looks like it does. Is that what I'm relegated to? What's the point if none of the options I'm given are the slightest bit appealing? A gust shot hard snow across the window, making a momentary rain stick sound. With half-lowered eyelids, David stared despondently into the black. David's phone rattled on the table. Good, maybe an answer, he thought. He snatched it up. It said, only, 
I am here. David sat another three minutes, glaring in turns at the empty seat across from him, the nonsensical messages on his phone, and at the patrons around the room, who were definitely not his date. Then he muttered, God damn it, stood, put on his coat in a hurry, and stormed out of the cafe. As he hoofed it through the drifting snow toward his dead and cold Toyota pickup, he continued cursing as the air clawed at his exposed face. He shoved snow from his door and windshield with the side of his jacket's arm, shaking, and sang aloud to himself, Of course, of course, of fucking course. He got in and cranked the ignition. It took a couple of seconds to turn over, and cold air blasted him from the vents. Back at his apartment, he threw himself onto his futon couch and opened up Tinder. He read the messages again and still could not understand what had happened. His thumb hesitated over the unmatch button. After a moment, he pressed it, and Nadia disappeared. Show me anyone, he thought. Get me talking to anyone, anyone the slightest bit attractive to me. That's all I want. He went to the tab for his swiping cue. He was staring at Nadia. God damn it, he thought. Must have pushed her back into my queue when I unmatched. He was about to swipe left without another thought. But for some reason, he decided to pass through her profile again, perhaps seeking some degree of understanding for what just happened to his date. He saw the first bathroom selfie, and the second, and then the looped video in the snow by the lake as she casually turned her gaze away. And then finally the third mirror selfie, with the mirror-in-mirror -mirror effect of cascading iterations of Nadia, from ahead and behind, and the phone screen that didn't match the photo she was taking. He pulled down on the image to zoom in. The array of pixels, mostly red and black, that filled her phone's screen made the rough shape of an hourglass, and the top of the hourglass had run out. David swiped her profile away. Give me someone else he thought bitterly. Nadia came up again. What the fuck? He said aloud. He swept left. Same cover picture. Same mascara glare. Nadia, 23, five miles away. David swept left. Nadia, 23, five miles away. He swept left. He swept left many times, and by around the 20th time, it had changed to Nadia, 23, four miles away. David swiped in a delirium of panic and disgust. Nadia, 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 always Nadia, 23, closer and closer. And the shadows pulled from her eyeliner and her droll mouth, creeping into the photo and consuming it, like ink bleeding across a page with each swipe. The image became black, black after black after black over and over again. David began to laugh. Nadia, 23, less than a mile away. He swiped. Nadia, 23. I am now here. He swiped one more time and she was gone. The empty Tinder queue, which should have read, There is no one new in your area, said only. There is no one. As David read, the line warped into another phrase. It read, End of the line, Valentine. He threw the phone. The wind began to rattle the doors and windows. I am here, he muttered, standing from the couch. He ran out into the night. The cold tore at his bare arms and neck and cheeks. The wind passed uninhibited through his sweatpants like a ghost unimpeded by the walls of mortal tenements. His breath formed clouds as he ran down the sidewalk toward the creek, where there was a bridge and where trees, bare save for the icicles and clumps of snow, hung over branches beckoning like the morose ushers at a theater dressed in black and white. As David ran onto the bridge, time seemed to loop. As his foot fell onto the bridge and then picked up again, suddenly that same foot was taking its first step onto the bridge once again. The falling snowflakes rewound and started again from where they were, and the bridge bounced up in his vision, with his gait, and reset, and bounced again. With each iteration, Subtle changes were made. 
The trees that nearly surrounded him receded and seemed at least a mile away. That was the first revision. Then, as he thought he heard someone cry his name, the creek became a placid, frozen lake. Then the streetlights bled into the sky to create a daytime overcast. The footbridge became a pier of wood slats, and on it, ahead of him, there was a bench. With another revision, a shadow bled through the bench and became a girl. Nadia looked away. Time reset, and Nadia adjusted her leg and looked away again, and again, as David's vision bobbed in the exact vantage of what he had supposed had been a camera in the looped video. The final revision was this. Nadia became less a girl. The leg she adjusted seemed to break and bend backwards at the knee, and to grow upward like a tree. The other projections erupted similarly upward. The core of her body blurred and rounded and swelled. Her face became like the bald fingers of a clutched black fist. She was a spider, dead. A black widow belly up on the pier the size of a small car, with her tortured rigor mortis legs clasped around nothing in the winter air. In the mandibles of her mouth and around her vacant eyes, something like maggots writhed, and on her fat belly there was a red hourglass. The top of the hourglass had gone empty. The loop broke and David ran toward her, just as her long, dead legs parted to embrace him. The message she received had simply read, I don't want to be alone. Madeline's breath clouded in front of her as she stood from her car just in time to see David take off down the street in a t-shirt and sweatpants. She ran after him, calling his name, but he didn't seem to hear. He disappeared into the trees at the footbridge, and by the time she caught up, he was gone. His tracks ended at a disturbance in the snowdrift halfway down the bridge, and she refused to acknowledge this at first, gazing up the bridge toward the street across, and then even back the way she had come. But then Madeline made herself look down at the shelf of ice over the creek, where David lay, splayed out, red seeping into the snow from his ears and nose. She clutched at her mouth. In another week, the cold relented. The birds began to sing.
You've just heard a track called Train by To Edit Is Human from the album Explained and Unexplained Sounds, Part 1. Explained. Ella, you are an excellent dancer, particularly for somebody who literally has two left feet. Dr. Frankenstein works wonders, doesn't he? And where'd you get those lookers? Off a dead girl in Luxembourg. Gorgeous. She was a lucky girl. Until I made sure she met her train right on time. And is that a gerbil in your pocket? Oh, that? I got that off a young chap in London. Hmm. Did he have a pet shop? The little fellow sure is skittering around. Maybe it's time to feed him? Something like that. What's going on? I think White Willie's coming. This is the part of the song where you try to run. Come a little bit closer. You're my kind of man. Uh... Oh my god! It's White Willie! All shit's going down. Is that... Willie, honey, there you are. Is that... Oh my god. It's you. White Willie is... I've been looking everywhere for you. You're just as pallid and lumpy as I remember. My dear, dear little Jimmy. Monster Porn Podcast is a production of Warped Box Media. Today's story was In the Dead of Tinder by me, Brent Norwood. Good job, me. Musical interlude provided by To Edit Is Human. If you dig these chill electronic post-rock vibes as we do, check out To Edit Is Human, toeditishuman.bandcamp.com. Music